Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, thanking all the organizers, uh, Mike Duff, Lars, and uh, for, for the invitation. It's been a great meeting and uh, somehow a very emotional one as well. Um, I uh, went to the University of Tasmania and did my PhD together with Bob Del Borgo. So, um, you know, I don't know if you know Tasmania, there's about a thousand sheep per person. So it's, you know, knowing anyone who knows anyone is very difficult. Knowing anyone who knows someone is pretty hard as well. And I was lucky enough that Bob was a student of Salaam's. And so I heard about Salaam and the ICTP at a very early age. And it was nice. It was really nice. I liked the stories. And then I had the opportunity to go to Trieste as a postdoc, and of course the first thing you do is you go and visit Salam, and the first thing he does, as we heard, is he asks you, what are you doing? And you start, and then he stops you straight away. Um, I think I got about three words out, and he said, no, 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 you're wasting your time, more or less. What you should be doing is string theory. And what you should really be doing is string field theory. So uh, I thought, OK. Uh, you don't say no to a Nobel Prize winner. You certainly don't say no to your boss. So uh, I, I went away. I didn't know anything about string theory. And I certainly didn't know anything about string field theory. Uh, but I worked on it with another postdoc for about four months. Uh, we wrote a small inconsequential paper, I believe. Um, so I went back to Salaam and uh, our next meeting and of course he asked me what are you doing and I said well following your advice I worked on string field theory and said no 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 you shouldn't be doing that so uh, I'm a brash Australian so I got really fed up with that turned around and <coughs> said okay I know what I've been doing what have you been doing and Salam smiled. I mean, we, we heard about that sort of uh, gleam in his eye that he gets. He got the gleam in his eye, and he asked me to sit down, big smile on his face. And I think Spencer will relate to this. Salam looked at me and said, you know, Steve and I, we don't have to work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was uh, definitely put in my place. Um, but I was also won over. Uh, that was one of, the la uh, one of the first times I had a, a chance to, to uh, speak with Salam. He, we had a long conversation after that. He was very pleasant. It was really nice. We talked about physics, but we also talked about uh, what was very dear to his heart, and that is the ICTP itself. Um, and you could just feel the, the, the honesty of the man in this. It was really amazing. Uh, unfortunately for me, at that time, he started to, his campaign to uh, become the Director General of um, UNESCO, and so he was spending a lot of his time at that point away from the ICTP, which is a shame uh, for, for me, as I said, um, because on the rare occasions that he was there, it was just nice to see him, nice to hear what he had to say. Um, uh, I think somebody mentioned the fact that you tended to run into him in the corridor and you know, 10 seconds and he'd be trying to get you to do something. Okay, which brings me to something else. Um, by my reckoning, I'm going to be the last staff member, scientific staff member at the ICTP that actually knew Salam. When I retire, there will not be a scientist at the ICTP who actually knew him. So there goes an era. Um, I didn't know him as well as many of you did, and so it's always sort of getting less and less, but this is, I think, the cutoff line. And it's important to continue the vision that he had for um, outreaching to the developing world and making sure that things changed. And in a sense, I think um, I'm happy, very happy to say that Fernando's Cuvedo, Fernando Cuvedo's approach um, of instigating these new 
regional centers of the ICTP and the developing world is really one way that we can keep things alive, even when um, there aren't people there who actually knew Salaam. In particular, the one I'm involved with is the one in Rwanda. Uh, it's called the East African Institute of Fundamental Research. It's a five-story building, the building exists. It should have, at the end, something like six permanent researchers, 10, 15 postdocs, and of the order of 80 to 100, we're hoping, uh, masters and PhD students. That's the aim. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I was just going to ask if you could lend me some money. Um, no, that's not quite true. The Rwandan government is paying for all the administrative, has given us the building, is paying for the administrative staff, will pay for all the scientific staff, those six that I mentioned, um, and will partially fund the students. So all the Rwandan and students will be supported by the Rwandan government. We have to find money for students from the rest of Africa, essentially, or anywhere else, anyone who would like to go there. So that's, that's, that's an issue that you know very well, a problem of finding funding. Um, the, the reason I bring it up is because we will be advertising soon for positions, scientific positions, um, at at the Institute, so if you know of any brilliant young people who would like to go and do something uh, to, we hope, a very good place and to do good research and to help, then please let them know. Uh, keep an eye out for it. And if you have any ideas on, or if you know any agencies that might be willing to support such an endeavor, I'm always happy to hear about it. Okay. So um, with that, I'll get... Uh, <coughs> Yes, of course. Um, that's a good question. Um, because they want it. Uh, because they are willing to put money into it. And there's no nonsense. I don't know if you look at these lists of corrupt countries, you'll find of the African countries, Rwanda is on the, on the bottom of if corruption's that way. <laughs> um, Rwanda's at the bottom. In fact, Rwanda does a lot better than some European countries, in case anyone's interested. So it's a, it's, it was a place to, to work with. We, uh, the ministries are very helpful. Everyone's, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, from the whole spectrum, we've been having support from them. So it's worked out. <coughs> Um, I, I think that attitude also comes f as a rebound from the genocide that they had, I should say. Okay. Um, right, so I'll, I'll start with the uh, talk, the scientific talk. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Chern Simon's theory uh, with a complex gauge group on cipher fiber three manifolds. Uh, basically uh, work with Matthias Blau, who's in Bern. All right, so I better tell you what the theory is. Uh, as you can see, it uh, basically takes the standard Chern-Simons uh, description. This is my connection. Uh, that's my three manifold. These are all forms, so they're all top forms. This is it's essentially um, conjugate, um, the best way to think of this in the complex case is you just write it as a normal connection plus i times another connection. So they're all one forms with values in the Lie algebra of the group <laughs> that you first thought of, and that's the compact group, not, uh, I should say one more thing. I'm always thinking about uh, the complexification of a compact group G, so that's what I mean. Um, if you, uh, we have the coupling constants, T hat is not necessarily T, uh, the complex conjugate, but I write it as if it is, but that depends on whether S is um, imaginary or not, so we have this formula. Um, and now if you just write that object in uh, components, you get this and this. And the A is the usual, say, uh, G gauge field, and that part there 
is what would be um, conventional Chern Simons theory, and the extension gives us these two terms. In particular, you see that if I switch S off and uh, I just look at that, it's not that I just get the standard guy, but I also get this small contribution over there. Um, as you probably all know, the, uh, the compact, in the compact case, the parameter k, which should be sitting right there and is missing, um, has to be uh, an integer with the normalizations that I choose. Uh, because if you do large gauge transformations, remember what we have is a three manifold. So if we take a map from um, the three manifold into the compact group, then you very quickly see that those things are quantized, those maps are quantized. And if you want the exponential of i, little, sorry, square root of minus one of this thing uh, not to change, then you need that k is integral. Uh, unitarity is a different issue. Possibly the best way of seeing the rules that I'm telling, that I give you here, is just to ignore what I wrote and just go back there. Remember that the um, action uh, is this, and the path integral has the exponential of square root of minus one of this, little i of that. And so you should imagine that you have an i in front of this and an i in front of that, and providing k and s are real, then that's an oscillating integral and has a chance of uh, being convergent. Otherwise, if, um, if one of them is imaginary, say S is imaginary, then you can see that you, you have to rethink what's going to happen. So I'm going to take the case where K and S are real. And in that, case, in that situation, we have um, unitary theory. OK, so why is it interesting? Um, Gauge theories with a complex gauge group are difficult to make sense of. Usually if you, say, are in Euclidean space and you have, um, um, you, you make the split into these gauge fields A and B, then the Yang-Mills action could be something like e to the minus norm squared of the curvature of A. But if you have a complex gauge group, what you would actually get is e to the minus of the norm squared of the curvature of A plus the norm squared of the curvature of A squared of b, which is not very good for convergence. So they're difficult to play with. Um, in the case of, in Minkowski space, that minus sign would actually cause one of those particles to be fictitious. So you always have problems. In our case, you just saw that we don't have a problem because our path integral is really just an oscillatory integral in Euclidean space. I should have said that too. My manifold m is a Seifert manifold. Um, and hence, it's Euclidean compact closed. Um, oh, sorry. I managed to get that wrong. OK, so <coughs> evidently, uh, according to the work of people like uh, Dimoft, uh, Gukov, Zagier, Holland, uh, and a bunch of others, there's a 3D3 correspondence between supersymmetric theories. And on one side, you end up having to study complex Chern Simons. So it's well worth knowing what the answer is. Um, I should also say there should be another mark here, and that is to say that these things are related to intersection pairings on uh, moduli spaces of vector bundles over Riemann surfaces, which is something that I think will appear in the next talk. Um, my interest is here. Uh, that is, it's very rare that you can do a path integral exactly this is a case where we can, so I thought I'd present it. Um, there is this notion of holomorphic factorization that has been going around, I think, um, developed by, again, Gukov, Dimofta, Holland, Witten, others. And uh, given that we can actually solve the theory, you can actually just check to see everything is OK as far as uh, holomorphic factorization is concerned. And actually, this should be. Uh, one more point, and that is because I uh, promised to uh, send an email uh, 20 years ago uh, to this gentleman. Uh, because uh, 20 years ago or so, he was uh, in visiting ICTP or CISER, I think, at the time. And we had begun to discuss SL2R um, uh, 
Yang mills on a Riemann surface. And I promised, and I remember this clearly, that I'd work on it a little bit um, to start it off and then send what I thought about it to him. And he's still waiting. Um, this is, in a sense, a small way of saying sorry. Um, uh, the nice news is I still can't do SL2R, but I do know how to do SL2C. <laughs> so apologies. <laughs> Okay. Okay, how are we going to do it? Well, we'll pick a three manifold, which is itself an S1 bundle. So uh, the three sphere is an S1 bundle over S2, uh, for example, something like that. And once you've got an S1 um, and, a no, and the generator of that, doesn't, of that S1 doesn't vanish anywhere, then you can do Fourier analysis on the S1, okay? So what we can do is then think of a problem as being some sort of base space with an S1 floating around, and we do a Fourier analysis and we write everything out in modes of the S1, uh, but the coefficients will now just be fields on the base manifold. All right. Uh, actually, our base manifold will be, um, for technical reasons, in, for this talk, will be uh, essentially, the two sphere with n orbifold points. So that's a singular space, but the three manifold itself is a smooth space. So that'll be the manifold. Now, what we're going to do is to pick a gauge so that cubic looking theory that we had at the start turns out to only require us to know how to do Gaussian integrals. So that's the aim. Um, once we have Gaussians, well, we can integrate things out. So basically what you do is you take the Lie algebra of the gauge group, you split it into the Cartan subalgebra. This is all complexified, so you split it uh, into the Cartan subalgebra and to the uh, root spaces, the charge fields, and uh, integrate out the charge fields. So what you will be left with is a theory um, which is only abelian. Meanwhile, because you've got the modes on the circle, you can also integrate all, all the heavy fields. If you're thinking of Galutza Klein, take all the massive modes, integrate those all out. And so essentially what you're left with, down the bottom there, is an abelian uh, theory on the base manifold. Now, two-dimensional abelian theories are dead easy to solve. And so once we get there, we're finished. So uh, as I, I want that I get stopped on time, I feel guilty about uh, time issues, I'll give you the answer. <laughs> there it is. Um, w is the Weyl group. N is a vector of integers. Uh, this D has to do with the, I haven't written it there. Oh, yes, I have the order of the first uh, homology group of uh, the three manifold. Uh, we're integrating over ranks, uh, ranks worth of complex variables, and this is the racing torsion. This is actually the complexified racing torsion. It takes this form here. There it is. That should be, sorry, that should be a I. I apologize. Um, it's a very simple, um, product. So if you look at the, act, the kind of finite dimensional action, there's no fields here. This is just finite dimensional integrals. Um, you see that I've got uh, a rank's worth of z's, a rank's worth of integers. This is just the trace. You think of these living in the Cartan and take the trace. This first churn class here is just the first churn class of the line bundle complex line bundle which defines the, whose circle bundle defines the three manifold. So that's just data um, of the three manifold sitting right there. So the data of the three manifold in, in here is D, these AIs, they're the order of the orbifold points, and the first churn class just there. And that's the answer. And actually this is very simple, this is just some matrix model. 
Okay, so finite dimensional matrix model. So our aim is to derive this formula. So let's start with the manifold. So uh, as I said, M is some um, S1 bundle over some uh, Riemann surface, in this case, uh, the two sphere. And the way you designate it is, well, the, the S1 bundle is related to this complex line bundle. Zero means the genus is zero. A1 is the order of the orbifold point, and B1 is the associated order on the fiber. And locally, the best way to imagine it, oops, um, locally, the best way to think about it is if this is a small disk, this is a complex uh, variable, so you're on a, a base uh, Riemann surface, you've got a small disk, you've got a small copy of C, uh, <laughs> C above you, then the local picture of that three manifold is that you take those points and you identify by the action of an eighth root of unity. That's the A that appears there. And the B that appears there on this factor is that B that appears right there. Okay? So that's the way you build these three manifolds. Um, and then the only thing you need to know is that M is smooth if and only if the greatest common divisor of these A's and B's is equal to one for each of those. And furthermore, it's a rational homology sphere. That is, it has the rational homology of um, the three sphere. Only if the genus of the base is zero, which is why I took zero up there. And if you can write the first churn class uh, roughly in this fashion. As I said, the first churn class which appeared only depends on the data of the three manifold. That's the order of H1 there. And this is the order of the A's. You'll notice the B's are making no entrance whatsoever in this formula. And that's funny, but it's, but it's um, in standard churn Simon, compact churn Simons, what happens is something similar. The Bs only appear in the framing. Um, there is no framing in this case. This is a um, result of Barnatan and Witten. And so we don't see the Bs. OK. So. Uh, well, I have a three manifold, which is an S1 bundle, so I have a connection. Uh, that is a globally defined one form on it. K is the dual vector field and of the S1 rotation. So that means that I have a way of globally decomposing all my fields. So I do. I write any connection as a connection which is horizontal, uh, meaning that it has no component in the K direction, or the kappa direction, sorry. These are one forms. Uh, in the kappa direction, and a component in the kappa direction. You should think of this guy as living on the Riemann surface, as living on the base. Likewise, for the B field, we have the same. Of course, A and phi are, are anti-emission matrices. B and lambda are also anti-emission matrices. If you make this decomposition and just write out the action, you get this mess. But you see that telltale situation, phi squared minus lambda squared. This is usually what causes problems when we quantize with a complex gauge group, as I was saying. And in our case, it makes no difference because if I have an i there, whether I have e to the i phi squared or e to the minus i phi squared, you don't really care too much. All right. So this is the complicated mess that we've got. But if you have a good look at it, you see that uh, if you look at the a's and the b's, they never enter cubically. They only ever enter quadratically. So we've got a's and b's everywhere but they're all quadratic. So my aim is to integrate out all the A's and B's which live in the ortho complement of the Cartan subalgebra and all of them which uh, have mass in the sense of kaluza klein mass, that is that they're non-zero modes uh, in the S1 direction. Right. So to do that, I need to choose my gauge. And what I'll do, I have enough degrees of freedom to do it, is I'll choose that along the S1, phi is constant. And along the S1, lambda is constant. That's my gauge. So I'll get ghosts for that. And now I know they're constant. That means I still have gauge transformations which do not depend on the S1. That is, I still have gauge transformations which only live on the base Riemann surface. So 
I can still, oh, sorry, use that degree of freedom to conjugate uh, theorem and Lie algebras that you know very well is that you can conjugate any um, uh, group element uh, into the uh, maximal torus, or if you like, you can actually uh, conjugate any Lie algebra element into the Cartan subalgebra, which is all this says. So I'm just using the residual freedom to kill the charged fields, the charged part of phi and lambda. So they're the cage conditions. And if you uh, do uh, make, choose that gauge, those gauges, then um, you will, and sorry, going back. So we've chosen those gauges. So here phi is only Lie algebra valued. Here it's only Lie algebra valued. Um, here is here again. And is there any other important term? No. So the lambdas like are the same. So the the only way the b's enter here is the charged b's, the charged a's. Likewise here, the charged ones. The interacting ones are always charged. Okay. So they're the ones we're interested in. And you, if you uh, fully expand everybody, you get some op well. You get, just get some operator for expand it. This is the determinant that, gets by, that you get by integrating out the A's and the B's. I wrote horizontal because I mean that they're horizontal to the um, uh, action of the S1. This funny symbol here is what you always get when you put a backslash LK in latex. Don't know why, but I think it's gothic K. And it's just supposed to mean the stuff that lives outside of the cartan. Um, this is the corresponding thing that you, you get from the ghost. Now it turns out, uh, I don't really have time to show you, uh, that the ghost determinant and the gauge field determinants almost cancel. That's a great uh, thing. This is a topological field theory, so we might have guessed that such a thing would happen. And if you... Uh, Look at all the modes, you get huge products over n, where n designates the modes along the S1 direction. Those, all those products end up giving you just this. This very simple object, which we saw on this, one of the first slides, which is just the ray Singer torsion. Actually, this is an extension of the uh, ray Singer torsion to the complex case. The ray Singer torsion is defined for fields which are unitary. These are not unitary. and um, uh, what we've learned from doing just this calculation is that the ray Singer torsion for the uh, GLN gauge fields is act actually factorizes into the two, two parts of ray Singer torsion. That's what you learn. So um, that, that object uh, was defined by Muller, mathematician. Um, I couldn't find that statement in his paper, so possibly not known to mathematicians. All right. Um, OK, these are just the fields that I've been integrating out. Um, if you want to do it correctly, you've got to remember that the fields are actually sections of a line bundle. And if you want to do Fourier modes, then you just have to remember that there's the mode is the nth tensor power of that particular line, and so on and so forth. You just have to be careful with everything. If you are careful, that's what you get. For the absolute value of that determinant, actually, you can show that there is no phase. So I write it. And again, I want to emphasize that this is uh, the equivalent determinants in the compact case have a phase. It's complicated to um, evaluate. Uh, it's a Tia Sigapatodi uh, type object that you have to calculate and you get the phase. But here there is none. So that's good. So now we've integrated out all the fields in the vertical direction. So we've only got stuff on the base. And that means we have a two-dimensional quantum field theory to do. Um, two-dimensional quantum field theories are easier than three-dimensional quantum field theories. So we're almost there. So we have 
the racing of torsion, that's that, those ratios of determinants that we sort of calculated. And we have just the leftover part of the action which we didn't touch when we did the Gaussian integration. Uh, that, apart from the ends here, is just what you see in front of you. Apart from the ends there, this, this is just the part which we didn't touch when we did the integrals. Um, the ends here are there mainly because I lied to you. Uh, yeah, I, five, ten, zero? Five. Five. <laughs> five minutes. I, I prefer his offer. He's giving me ten. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so um, I lied to you, and that's because the gauge where we rotate the thing into the uh, Cartan subalgebra is singular, and you have to be very, very careful about the singularities that you create. This is like the old things that Atoft was doing way back. Uh, when, when he was looking at uh, strange gauge conditions, you get defects and you have to take those into account. In our case, the defects simply amount to please remember to sum over all U1 bundles. So, okay, we're told to sum over all U1 bundles. That integer there is just the, the fact that the field strength has a component which is non-trivial. That is, this is the first churn class of what would have been the field strength. And this is now just a form living in here, no longer a connection. But that's it. So this is now a two-dimensional theory, and you can see it's Gaussian. And we still have a gauge field living in here. All right. Uh, I haven't told you what the sum over n really does. That depends on details. And I've only got five minutes, so I'll speed up. Um, and I should say that we holomorphic you can see that we still have this kind of very nice uh, split into, you know, phi and phi bar evenly. Tau hat, as I wrote before, was the absolute value of something, so it's actually nicely splitting. So we have factorization even at this level. Um, so let me go on. The integral over, going back, the only place A appears is in here. So what's this? This is phi dA. If I integrate out A, that just says that d phi is equal to zero. So the net effect of integrating out A is to tell us that the phi is a constant. Now that the phi is a constant, I no longer have a field theory. I have finite dimensional integrals. And that is that. We now only have finite dimensional integrals. And this is the finite dimensional object with this action. OK. That action has a symmetry which happens to be the case uh, uh, if you happen to choose your compact gauge, gauge group to be SUN uh, or any simply laced group. It is not true. Uh, no, not, not for every simply laced group. I take that back. It's not quite true. Anyway, just hang in there. If it's true for SUN, um, that you get this, this formula, and then this becomes a symmetry. Once you have that as a symmetry, sorry, once you have that as a symmetry, you have to divide it out by it. But you see, that symmetry implies that because I can shift n by n plus dr, I can actually limit n to simply live in the range of 1 to d. And that's why, at the start, I did that. Um, there's also the Weyl group. The Weyl group acts naturally on the Cartan subalgebra as well as on its complexified friend. Um, and so, finally, the there are two equivalent formulae. Uh, you can uh, act. You can act with those two actions, semi-direct product here, on the um, field phi. Sorry, if I go back, this act. All, this also acts on phi. So does the Weyl group. So I can either think that I should quotient uh, phi by the action of uh, the combined. Sorry, action. Or I can think that I can limit the range of n and then divide out by the Weyl group, and that gives me these two formulae. There's one technical aspect um, which is clear, and that is that, uh, that those products of signs actually diverge. Um, uh, when the number of orbifold points is bigger than 2, so you should actually define these things. Um, 
you should actually define these things uh, carefully and there's a way of introducing masses and so on, which we have done and okay, within that context everything is good. Uh, last point, there's another way of interpreting the N. I said integrate over all the first shown classes uh, of the U1 bundles which have been liberated once you integrated out everything else, but time is up. That N can be thought of as coming from, um, as labeling flat connections on, on the three manifold because it actually represents a Yang Mills connection on the Riemann surface. I'll stop there. Thank you. So we can have one or two short questions. Have you calculated the Wilson loop on a simple curve? Uh, yeah, so, so what we've done is we've calculated the Wilson. Uh, uh, okay, so one thing I should tell you is that you can um, represent the same three manifold in many ways. So in S3, we've calculated a lot of torus uh, links, uh, knots, by representing S3 in different ways. We, so the S1, right, can either be free, that's one possibility, or it can be any torus knot. And we've actually calculated all the torus knots in S3 just by re-representing S3. Another question? Yeah. Oh, I, I should say this will appear sometime next week, I hope. In cases where your three manifold has an S1 factor, can you do a Hamiltonian uh, formulation of that? And maybe it's simpler even? Uh, yeah, okay. No, it's harder. <laughs> I think it's harder because these are non-compact space. In, in that case, you would be looking at a non-compact space. And so you would have to really look for square integrable uh, sections, as you know. So in that case, it, I think it's not so easy. I cannot do it, I, I, I propose. So I, I don't want to exclude it. And the reason I can't do it is because I can do S2 cross S1 but I cannot do any higher Riemann surface, genus Riemann surface cross S1 because there are zero modes. I mean, you can do it. You just get zero modes and the whole thing uh, becomes nonsense. So one has to learn how to deal with zero modes. So. Okay, so let's thank him again.